Hi, you're listening to Collectively Speaking by the Birthday Collective, a bottom-up initiative to develop ideas about Singapore's future. Welcome to this space where birthday book alumni have conversations about the things that matter to them, to us, and to Singapore. We hope that you will be a part of the many conversations we will have, or perhaps to even start your own. And now, onward with the episode. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, so I'm Kita, and with me is also Chris. Hello. And the both of us are going to be moderating this conversation from the birthday booklet on education. Mm. With us, and we're so happy to have them, are Hazel, Jamie, and Arunan, all of whom have contributed for the purposes of the booklet. And we're going to have some great conversation right now. Mm. So Chris, if you get launching. Thanks, Gita. So maybe the first question we can start with is, um, so if you could go back in time and look critically at your educational choices, what would you want to tell your future self? So maybe, Arena, we can begin with you. Sure. If I could go back and look at a lot of my education choices, um, and I wasn't the most, I didn't have the most successful edu- uh, education journey till I got to uni, so um, I was mathematically challenged. So I'd tell myself not to obsess over the small failures or even the big ones, mm. and that um, someone who has um, courage in his or her conviction and resilience will eventually find success. You just have to keep trying and mm. keep an open mind. Mm. I think that's a very useful advice, given how much uh, things in the world today seem to be full of uncertainty. It's very easy to get uh, locked in to this idea that I have to do it right or I will fail. So yeah. uh, thank you for reminding us about that. Hazel, what about yourself? Yeah, for myself, I've always gone with the very safe option mm. of what uh, my parents have been telling me, what my friends have been telling me, and yeah, just everyone um, around me that was saying things like, oh, just do science because at least you know that uh, what you know is, it's it's going to be very clear if you have the content ready for the exams. Like, don't go and do something like literature or history, <laughs> oh, well, which everyone me. in this room <laughs> has, has, has experience with. Although in secondary school, these were the subjects that were really interesting to me. I would always be the first one to grab my lit book and then like run off for the next class, for wow. literature class. But um, yeah, but as I was going to junior college, people were telling me like, yeah, just because you did well in um, literature in secondary school doesn't mean anything when you get to JC. So just don't do it. Um, because, you know, like the essay question could be anything. You might think that you're an A student, but it turns out like very badly (laughs) so I just went with what I felt was the safe option because Mm. at that point in my life I felt like um I better you know err on the safe side because I don't want to be in a situation where I have no um, choice at the end of the day that was what um yeah I felt back then so all along it has always been just going with what Mm. felt the safe route yeah. No, I'm sure this is exactly the sentiment that many of our listeners will find resonates with them because it's very often that we're told, why do you want to take a risk? Life, uh, you know, something that you should build upon to create certainty for yourself and your own future. Jamie, what about yourself? What mm. are your thoughts? Um, I came into this um, with the essay I had written for the birthday book, which precisely talks about this. Um, where I had reflected on the mistakes I had made in my education career, um, but realized in retrospect that actually the mistakes um, were good to make in that they forced me to think about um, how to live with them, how to live with their consequences, and how then to learn from them ultimately. So I think in my essay, I did say that actually that was what I wanted to tell my students as a teacher, that they should should worry less about making mistakes because in the end, mistakes are all things that they can learn from. Mm. I think um, looking for the silver lining is something we forget to do. But actually, every time you fall down, when you pick yourself up, there is a moment of contemplation where you really know what's going on. So thank you very much for having you know those observations for our listeners. I think we're going to move now into our second question and then maybe we can sort of, you know, unpack... uh, the precise way in which you foresee the future Mm. that awaits all of us. Yeah, so thanks so much, everyone. The second question would be, um, how do you think listeners should, or rather learners, should future-proof themselves in these complex times, especially given COVID and things like that? Mm. Jamie, shall we go with you? Yeah. So, 
I have been thinking about this because I do work in the space of、um, continuing an adult education.、Um, Future proofing is not my favorite word.、Um, I do think that it does conjure up a sense of、um, wanting to hedge your bets and and maybe. Trying to second guess、um, what your decisions are in education, which I think in the first question we've kind of talked about. I I don't actually believe that there are real mistakes that you can make in education. I think if、mm. you choose to learn,、mm. I, I don't think there's a mistake there.、Mm. I think the concern about future proofing is、um, in in the context I've heard about it in recent times. It's more in an economic sense than it is in an education sense. I believe that nothing you learn can go to waste.、Mm. The idea of future proving is the sense that what you learn can have economic rewards.、Mm. Um, so, in my view, this is an economic decision. So, if you are interested in future proving your education.、Um, Don't worry about learning,、uh, but you can find out if you want in the next ten years、um, what might be、uh, in demand in the economy. And I think this, I, I think this information is freely out there, and the government、uh, also gives out the information, and you can draw from that. But in general, all learning is good learning. Hmm, powerful statement. All learning is good learning. I think we'll all agree with you. Yeah. That、um, it's about finding the pathways. Yeah, and, and like, then yeah. yeah. So, sorry to interrupt you, Gita. I would like to build on that.、Uh, I think Jamie brought up really、uh, powerful points right there. In particular, I think that expansive view that、uh, Jamie had towards education is very interesting because it almost seems like a almost like a dichotomy, right, between、um, education for education's sake as an end in itself versus education as a means to achieve a larger end goal, which I think goes back to a point about the economic perspective. Yeah. So I just thought that. That would be an interesting kind of a summary of sorts of、uh, Jamie's、uh, point. But back to you, Gita. No, no, no. And I think that、uh, one of the things that we've all picked up on is the idea of utility、mm. and the the fact that sometimes we make so many decisions based on the utile we're going to gain from that decision,、yeah. rather than the pleasure we might have in other ways of perceiving our life's ends and life goals. So Hazel, I mean, you've just come out of school and、uh, <laughs> in a very difficult time. So let's. Take your perspective、uh, of the future,、mm. and and bearing what Jamie said, perhaps not just future proofing yourself, but maybe thinking about being future ready,、mm. future open. However ways you'd like to think about it, what would you suggest to us?、Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this question about future proofing has been something that I've been thinking about since um since I was teaching in school. Like, how do we get our students ready for the future?、Mm. And、um, I guess future proofing to me would be more of a mindset thing than、um, a skills and knowledge kind of thing. I say that because、um, when I used to talk to my students about future proofing yourselves, they used to tell me things like, "Oh, so I will definitely go and learn coding. I will <laughs> learn machine learning." So it's all about you know actual like hard skills that、mm -hmm. they're going to learn. Yeah. But I think future proofing is so much more than that. It's about、um, being willing to be that novice. Um, mm. Being willing to be able to reinvent yourself, so I guess、um, for someone who was very weak at mathematics in school,、um, I decided that okay, I'm not gonna let this、uh, hinder me, right? So I decided that I was going to like take that plunge and do quantitative methods in ecological research when I was in my fourth year in uni.、Wow. So I guess.、Um, That is kind of what I see, like future proofing as, as kind of being willing to not be like the best at everything you do, but、mm. being willing to kind of like try new things and、mm. um, being adaptable and being agile and you know doing different things, things、yeah. that are like completely out of your comfort zone, things、mm. that you have never done before, like a podcast like this for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, building、yes. on your point, is I cannot help but also、uh, let our listeners know that the minute you mentioned about not being very mathematically inclined, that we had a grin from. From、uh, Arunan as well, so you, there's his company <laughs> in that sense. And I think that what was very interesting is what you said about taking the plunge and doing、mm. things that maybe you may not always be best at, but saying to yourself, it's about the adventure, the adventure of、uh, exploring, so that you can grow yourself,、mm. and that that is a useful thing because、uh, it made me think about. The World Economic Forum and what they've been saying that if you want to stand yourself in a good stead, whatever way that. Might be agility is one of the 
facets that you need to develop for this future that awaits us. Yeah, actually, can I build on that, Gita? I think that's a very good point about agility and it goes back to Jamie's um, art, um, chapter, right? About, you know, learning from one's mistake. And it almost seems as though that one needs to be able to reframe the understanding of mistakes in order for one to be agile, right? If one cannot accept the fact of failure or embrace failure as a learning opportunity, and I think Arunan also writes that in his article and Hazel as well, then yep. uh, it's very hard to be agile. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so Arnon, over to you. Yeah. Uh, building on this idea of um, you know, your common link to math <laughs> as well as our common link to education and looking at the future. What would you suggest are some of your thoughts? I think uh, similar to what Jamie and Hazel said, I think uh, when we when I think think about myself as an educator and think about my students, right? And we say future-proofing, right? And that term, right? I think it's about creating awareness and yet not obsessing over that term. Mm. Uh, I mean, a year ago, I hadn't heard of Zoom. This is now my default to run <laughs> lessons. You know, I would, you've told me a year ago. So it meant that we need to, if a student asks me, how do I future-proof myself? I would say, um, you need to be resilient. You need to be fluid. You need to be open. And together with beyond all of that, beyond the books and the grades, you need to know what your skills are, what you're passionate about, what and how to hone them, not just for uh in a way that benefits you, but in a way that benefits the world today and beyond. Mm. So it is also being sensitive to what the world is needing now and what the world will need ahead of time. And I think that's how you future proof yourself. And you're not obsessed over it because you have no control over certain things and aspects or what would happen so that that when when someone asks me how would how do they future prove themselves this is what i would um tell my my, yeah. my kids yeah thanks so much arunan i think um building on your point uh there's clear resonance between arunan's point and hazel's point right because um it sounds as though when you mention about uh when your students ask you about you know future proofing being future ready you, you mentioned re- resilience fluidity openness that seems more like learning dispositions rather than hard yeah. skills, right? That I think Hazel was talking about, you know, uh, like some students having that preconceived notion that it's AI and you know, machine learning. <laughs> so I think that's a very interesting point to elucidate that we, we cultivate these kind of learning dispositions uh, that might help us in the future in that way. Yep. And I, I think that uh, we've ended on a, a note with this question, which is always interesting and which I might toss around a little bit. Um, the idea of not just looking at the future in terms of your own existence in that mercurial future Mm -hmm. or this existential future, but rather what does the future require of us in order to enable a future for more than ourselves, for communities to be uh, robust and for the global commons to be robust as well. So maybe uh, I was struck by Hazel and her ecological point. So I was just (laughs) going to say, Hazel, what do you think uh, as part of our engagement with the future you would want uh, learners to be aware of in terms of the fact that this is a time of a pandemic. This is a time of severe climate challenge. So what do you think mm. and how do you think we cultivate the generosity to think of other people and, and the human landscape and the, the physical landscape that we exist in as well? No small question there. Yeah, no. <laughs> but but we might as well. We have, you know, what's the point of True. staying with the easy stuff? Yeah, I'm going to need some time to think about that. And I'm sure all of us here have points to contribute to. So yes, I, I believe Gita's question is not just directed at me. No, no, not at all. It's going to come to everyone. So just thoughts that people might have, you know, because I think uh, it is so important to remember mm. we are not just asking to f- future-proof ourselves as mm. individuals. Mm. We exist with others. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess like I'm going off tangent here, but um, it's like how currently I feel like our assessments in schools are still very much focused on the individual's performance. Mm. And I guess part of, you know, future proofing ourselves, um, our learners would be to kind of um, put more emphasis on collaboration and being able to communicate our ideas. So just um, some time back, I think I, was, I came across um, this line that said something like ideas without influence is important. Wow. So I mm. guess like I started thinking back about my own education and then I started to um, kind of reflect on whether how much opportunity did I have to kind of uh, know how to communicate um, in a way that would convince the other person. It was a lot more of PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to tell you what I did. I don't really care if you are kind of convinced by what I said. Mm. So I guess like being part of the whole concept of 
future proofing, right, would be to kind of um, get ourselves more involved or rather like teaching our learners how to be able to communicate for the purpose of convincing others, influencing others. And also, um, how do you work with other people? We right. use mm. this term to a, to a point where it's almost like cliche. Like everyone knows you're supposed to work with other people, but what exactly does it mean to be mm. able to work with other people who ha- kind of like come from different dif- disciplines from you do? Yeah. So can a person from a mathematical background be able to communicate effectively with somebody from the literature background, mm. right? Like And building on uh, what Hazel said, it's also... I mean, I know we've been having a diss at Matt. So like sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when I, when I'm talking to someone, I'm like, yes, quadratic equations did nothing for me. I don't use that in my life anymore. What was the purpose of that? But at the same time, when a student comes and tells me, why, why do I need to know what a metaphor is? Mm. And I'm like, cause it's important because life is filled with metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think it's also giving them a certain type of ownership, right? And, and coming back to Matt's, um, one of the, works I, I I dealt with this year proof it's about maths and I was like of all the works something that deals with maths and I was having a discussion with one of my students and my student said oh you know it's interesting because um the playwright uses maths as a symbol to explore human relationships wow. and it's not about maths and I'm like you're right and and so as someone who's doing lit but also doing maths for them to be able to see um, and get some ownership of learning, not like, no, you need to know how simultaneous equations work or how quadratic equations work. But for them to be able to see value in what they're learning, yeah. I think that is quite important in uh, making um, students future-proof themselves so that they are not just learning something for a pedestrian purpose, but they they understand why they're learning, yeah. what they're learning, when they're learning, and, and they see value in it. I, I, I think that's important. Yeah. So, Jamie, what would your response be? Um... I think in Singapore, we've gotten so good at education that we have um, learned how to put education into two um, big boxes. One box is learning for personal development, learning for learning sick, and one box is learning for assessment sick. Mm. Mm. And I, I, I think we all know, and lots of people in Singapore agree, we've made the learning for assessment box so important that I think many people, even though they find the learning for learning box important, they don't dare to invest the time or the effort in it. Right. And I think in some way, I, this is not a, th- this is something that we've been talking about for a long time. And I think people are still trying to solve. This is something that we have as educators to emphasize again and again, because I think um, building on what Hazel said, in order for us to be able to connect this, and as Gita said, to connect this learning to for the world, not just for ourselves, learning has to be connected to the real world. So mm. as educators, I think we've all done this. Your, your students will say, how is this relevant? How is what you're teaching re- relevant to real life? Mm. And I think we all need to have our answers to that. And it needs to be very clear. And we cannot assume that students know it. They actually have to be shown it by us convincingly, we cannot say you're learning because you're getting tested on it in in October (laughs) because that is not the point of learning. The point of learning is that 10 years down the road, this is actually important and you will take it out to the wall. Um, So I think in some way, we actually have to, in all our small ways, try to make the first box, the one learning for learning sick and therefore for the world sick, a lot more important and a lot more salient to people. And I think we'll all do it in different ways. I think a lot of us are trying, parents, students, but somehow the second box looms very large. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that that is a important reminder that if there is no passion for what you read, what you think about yep. and what you engage with, there is also the, a dead end to that idea, going back to Hazel's idea that where's the influence that you can create with the idea? So that then takes us to our last question, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, very, very so, nicely. So mm. I really like Jamie's point um, um, in terms of the both spheres of learning for learning sake versus learning for an, an assessment, right? So once again, going between um, um, emphasizing the point of the means to achieve a larger ends or the intrinsic purpose. So on that note, though, uh, the last question that Gita and I have for our uh, wonderful guest today is what advice would you give to educators as they engage with future generations of young people? And I think maybe Jamie already touched a little bit about that already. So because of that, um, I'm just going to arrow Hazel um, <laughs> to, to begin the conversation as well. I think it would be to be more willing to listen to the student's voice mm. and 
take in their feedback because I think I know of some educators who think that um, students don't know better and we are the ones who are the masters of our content. Um, we know our craft, we know our pedagogy, yeah. but uh, without much thought to who the end users are mm. and just because they are from the same level that you might be teaching like year after year, right? Um, they could come from very different backgrounds and especially with like the changing demographics right now, I think we cannot just assume that all secondary three students are all the same. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I think um, this is especially so for teachers who are more seasoned. I mm. guess um, beginning teachers, right, at the beginning of your career, you would be very um, enthusiastic about asking your students like, what can I do better? You ask yeah. your mentors, what can you do better? At? But um, as teachers like uh, kind of like... Um, go into you know fourth fifth fifth maybe like even more years like they might feel like they already know what they need to know yeah. and then they become less um open to suggestions from students and yeah like kind of shutting down their voices early on which i think um is something that is so important that if we want to be um yeah um teaching our students and you know um, preparing them for a future we need to know what yeah our students are yeah yes. so three three quick points uh in, in response to hazel's point because i think um embedded in what you shared is also this um, um ethos of humility that a teacher must have i guess uh, if to, yeah. to to help with future future yeah. students yeah. as well uh, future learners as well and also this um concept of potentially accepting that that maybe students are not blank slates mm -hmm. that there's everybody has a schema yeah right uh, and you build on you firstly unleash what you have and you build on it right mm -hmm. so and i think uh, before maybe i pass the time to Arunan, i think what's so interesting is that our conversation seems to coalesce into this uh, point on agility and being able to acknowledge one's mistakes and learn mm -hmm. further and then maybe um, um, encapsulating your point Hazel it sounds as though that the advice that you would like to give to educators uh, on a whole is also being able to accept that we are imperfect mm -hmm. beings and that we need to keep learning yeah, yeah. yeah. so I don't know how about you I think it's very important uh, for teachers to to know for example this year I'm, I'm teaching a graduating cohort so the first thing you think about is okay your results your results yes. and then of course COVID came and pulled the rug from under our feet and then you and then as I stopped and I saw my kids going yes my results my results and I'm like guys calm down get sleep so um to to make them aware of something bigger to make mm -hmm. sure that we are nurturing them in a way that yes there's intellectual elasticity but there's also resilience hardiness and and they're also they're, they're also able to be uh quite introspective mm -hmm. and i think that's very important there are no tangible answers to these questions we have to keep asking ourselves right how to do it and and how to, how to do that for our kids um uh, and what we do now may be very different from what we do in five months or five years, depending on um, yeah. what's happening in the world at that point of time. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that it's a very good reminder, isn't it, that the only constant much said mantra is change. Mm -hmm. And change seems to be surrounding us at this point in time. And I think uh, Hazel's comment about not shutting people down, uh, affording the classroom, the dignity of mm. uh, of having of being a space where everybody has an equal chance to participate, and also that it doesn't matter what the age is. What more? What's more important is the attitude, and also mm. the responsiveness to information and the responsiveness to community. Yeah. So I was very struck by the idea that well, I that we need to have this generosity of spirit, which yeah. is what you suggested as well, Christopher. That you know we need to have this generosity of spirit so that we can. Uh, build people who are enabled in an economic sense, but also <laughs> humanized and and perhaps sympathetic to all the wider things in the in the large landscape that's the world. Yeah. So uh, we have managed to get through quite a lot of questions. So I was uh, saying to myself that maybe we could end by making one statement each to say, um, I hope in the educational landscape that. <laughs> We'll just finish off with that. Okay, so I hope... I hope that in the educational landscape, whatever students encounter and build on will, beyond books and grades, uh, empower them. Mm. Hazel? I hope that in the educational landscape, all students, regardless of their starting points, would have the opportunities to kind of um, be the best people that they can be. Mm. And Jamie? Jamie? I hope that all of us will have the mis will have the opportunity to make lots of mistakes and to learn from them. 
Right. Thank you so much. So we're uh, just going to say, uh, maybe Chris, you'd like to add to the statement too. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, yeah, I'm no, going to throw it back to you too. Gita. Okay. All right. No worries. No worries. <laughs> Can I just cop out by saying that um, all of my answer is amalgamation of everybody's answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's some tru- truth in that, but uh, to answer Gita's question, um, I hope in the ed- educational landscape that um, every child uh, will have his or her own voice um, acknowledged in the classroom. Mm. And yes. and since I'm the one who started it, so my contribution, we I hope in the educational landscape of the future, uh, that we have time to talk to people like we're doing now mm-hmm. and to listen to people like we're doing now and then be able to build on each other's ideas so that we genuinely collaborative community yes. making conversation that's meaningful. So we want to thank you very much for being with us. So thank you to Jamie. Thank you to Arnon and thank you to Hazel. And uh, Christopher and I are very glad that you could be with us. And please, everyone, do remember this is about the uh, birthday booklet on education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Collectively Speaking by the Birthday Collective. We aim to be a brain, heart and hand trust for Singapore, focusing on the gifts we can offer to future generations. To find out more, visit our website at thebirthdaycollective.com and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at The Birthday Collective. If you enjoyed this episode, do subscribe and drop us a review.